the FIRST STEP Act. This landmark legislation will give countless current and former prisoners a second chance at life. We're here to talk about the FIRST STEP Act and how it's being inappropriately applied to veterans. It's an absolute outrage. Right. In particular, Biden, his administration, is favoring those inmates convicted of child sex crimes over those inmates with prior U.S. military service. How so? Notwithstanding the assurances that President Trump made that they weren't going to extend these benefits to the sex offenders, the Biden administration has interpreted the First Step Act in such a manner as to allow the most egregious of these offenders to earn early release from prison, to earn credits towards extended halfway placement, and at the same time, depriving those men with prior military service of being eligible to participate in those same programs. Okay. And they're doing this so based on technicalities. And that's what's the most outrageous part of it. Because what we're talking about are men who served our country. They fought for our country. They killed for our country. They all bled for our country. Notwithstanding okay. those factors, Biden has chosen to elevate the needs of the offender community over those men who served the country, which is what really is driving much of the outrage, particularly in the Veterans Reentry Program at Coleman, where I was the coordinator for a number of years, and men are just absolutely flabbergasted that every day we're watching these guys getting cut loose. Meanwhile, the men with two purple hearts, the men with bronze stars, with V for Valor, they're getting turned down administratively literally every week. But if you're, if you're a, a, you were a teacher for 10 years who was flying out of the country to have sex with moms, and you come back in the country and you get, you get arrested, you, they're getting time off. Yes. So people like that are getting time mm -hmm. off. So. Not, yes, not only are they getting sentence reductions, but they're also earning additional credits for extended halfway house placements. And so literally, these men that are known to be the type of men who target children right. are being returned to the community faster than they otherwise would have. What is the First Step Act? Well, signed into law in December 2018, uh, December 2018 by President Trump. Okay. The First Step Act is the most sweeping piece of criminal justice reform in at least a generation. Okay. Basically, it's designed to reduce recidivism by encouraging the men to participate in evidence-based reduction programs. Okay. What does that mean? Well, they've got a, a whole series of classes. There's 43 different programs that have been identified by the Bureau that they believe help with recidivism, right? No, like yes, help, help you get what re rehabilitated or placed back well, into break, either deal with anger management issues, break with criminal thinking issues, or simply to assist those inmates develop responsible adult skills. Right. You know, at Veterans Reentry, we had, which predated all of this first step back stuff, you know, we had five workshops. Right. Nobody left home. Nobody left prison without a job already lined up. Nobody went home homeless. Everybody left with their credit repaired and to the extent possible rebuilt. Everybody that was entitled to medical benefits and, you know, compensation benefits for their military service, they leave with their benefits in place. All right. As opposed to someone like me who went to the halfway house and had nothing. Uh, I had nothing, nothing prepared. I had nothing we had, yes. You, you don't leave. With, you leave with every single document. Already situated. Yeah. You got your driver's license, your social security card, your DD-214. Everything is in place. You know, whether it's your medical benefits, employment, education, post-secondary education. They get Pell Grants through the program. Guys go to voc vocational schools. Everything's already lined up. So in the 18 months prior to the pandemic, there was one man that returned down, that returned to federal prison after his release. In the three-year period prior to COVID, there were two. Okay. Now, you contrast that with the standard re recidivism rate. According to the U.S. Sentencing Commission, between 2017 and 2022, nationally, the recidivism rate for men leaving federal prison is about 50%. Okay. And so for a prison the size of Coleman with 2,300 men, that means 1,100 men are coming back to prison in five years. Right. Now, that's I've, high. That's it's well, ridiculous. Well, yeah. There are institutions that are in the 60%. Yeah. You know, 45% is celebrated. Now you contrast that with veterans reentry, where in the six-year period, 
there was five men that returned back to prison. And this is out of 600 men. It was a recidivism rate of less than 1%. That's why we were having tours and the federal judges are coming through the program. Right. Yeah. Marco Rubio sent his people to come through the program. Literally, we had military grade I mean, staff officers from CENTCOM come through. Basically, everybody started buying in because the recidivism rate is so low. And so it began as a pilot program at Coleman, lasted for about two years. Then it was formalized by our warden, Kathy Lane, locally at that particular prison. And then in 2022, the Bureau of Prisons adopted it nationwide. Now there's a veterans reentry program being made available at literally every federal prison. Well, the First Step Act is kind of modeled on that same principles. Unfortunately, a lot of the programming is still not consequential. Right. Men leaving prison, they need a job, they need housing, they need their credit repaired. Right. Like they don't need to be sitting in classes learning about which pronoun to use right. when dealing with you know, transgenders. Right. And you know, a lot of the programming that they have under the First Step Act is you know, men sitting around singing kumbaya, a lot of faith-based stuff, a lot of yeah, that's not going to help woke job, agenda right. type stuff that, quite frankly, doesn't get the man a job. Right. Well, and that's what, you know, it's funny whenever I, I'm interviewed or talk with someone who's law enforcement or stuff, and, they, and at some point it inevitably comes around to prison. Mm -hmm. And it's always like, you know, well, why is the recidivism rate so high? You know, you these guys went to prison, they were, you know— they were rehabilitated. I'm like, oh, that's not true. Like, mm -hmm. like other than let's say the the veterans program, like, you know, and maybe an RDAP, you know, veterans program and RDAP probably have, you know, very low, obviously low uh, recidivism, mm -hmm. right? So RDAP had about 40%. Really? I mean, I know, I'm sure it's nothing compared to the, yeah. the veterans, but it's still lower than the average. Yeah. So to me, and when guys are like, well, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that you get to the halfway house, you're desperate for money, you have no skills, nobody helps you get a job. You know, they, there's no way the health halfway house barely helps you to make it extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. um, they're looking; it, it feels like they're they're trying to send you back to, to jail for any infraction. Uh, uh, they make it very difficult to even get to to work and back to get to to go to the. It took like two three days for me to even get a pass to go to Walmart to buy clothes. I had a couple pairs of sweatpants and some t shirts. That's it. You know, mm -hmm. so you know they make it extremely difficult to get a job get to that job and get back. Then they take a chunk of your money. So if you're some guy who gets out and has three months halfway house, by the time he's got a job and saved even a little bit of money, he hits the street. He doesn't have enough money to get out an apartment. He doesn't have enough money to get his own vehicle. He does So in some ways they're probably better off in the halfway house. And when you get anxious and upset and, you know, disappointed and frustrated, most guys are going to go back to what they know works, which is crime. So, you you know, so, I mean, that's obviously why, that's why I think this is probably working because you're right. The biggest thing is get a job. Yep. If you have a job, as soon as you hit the, as soon as you hit the halfway house, you have a job and a way to get there and get back to the halfway house. You're, you're, you're ahead of 95% of, of everybody else in the halfway house. Because well, it the, takes weeks typically. The, like, the situation you discussed where guys are leaving in three months and they don't have a place to go or they're right. upside down. Look, we get transitional housing for everybody that needs it. So nobody leaves homeless. Right. So everybody has that six month to one year window. Now it's not gonna be a, a nice apartment or anything. It's basically, right. you know, a bunk in a dorm living, but at least it's a roof over your head. Bro, I was thrilled to have a, a I was I was lucky and thrilled to have somebody's spare room to stay in. Yeah. Most guys just don't have it, you know, so, but okay. And so that's why the recidivism rate is so low because when the curriculum was being prepared, we identified those areas that the men needed assistance with during that critical three to six month window. Because the amount of time, the amount of investment necessary to make sure that this guy, or to give the guy a high probability of not returning to prison is minuscule. For the first four years during the pilot program period and the first formal two year period, you know how much uh, funding the Veterans Reentry Program got from Congress or the BOP? Zero. So the prison was just was just Miss Ward came out of her pocket. Right. We had an executive at the prison that conceived of the program. We had a warden, Miss Lane, who staked her reputation and her political capital on the program, and they literally pushed it through with zero funding. Whereas you get these other programs where they're receiving tens of millions of dollars in appropriations a year, and you're getting a fifty percent recidivism rate.
Right. Well, like I said, you know, you don't need people sitting around holding hands, power of positive thinking bullshit. Right. You know, yeah. get the manager. We had literally, I can't tell you how many guys coming out of that program, we got jobs working at Amazon. And that's starting at 18, 19 bucks an hour. Right. The men that went through the CQIA quality assurance aspect of the program, they're leaving prison $30 an hour. And all those certifications are done in-house in the program. Okay. So, so what happened with the First Step Act, right? Like one, they, they get to earn extra, extra time off for taking the classes. Yes. They, they get to... Um, and if they're prepared to, the more prepared they are, the better, the better the classes, more prepared, the more time they're, they're obviously, uh, they're getting off their sentence and two, a better chance they have a success on the street. So why are those credits, despite the fact that they weren't supposed to be eligible, why are sex offenders getting them? Just the interpretation of the statute by the current administration. All right. You know, the... The men that you're ultimately going to profile in a little bit, none of them would be out today. Right. Under the Trump administration's interpretation of the statute. So while on the one hand, Biden's interpretation is laudable in the sense that he's trying to provide most of the men an opportunity to better themselves and give themselves a chance when they get out. Unfortunately, a lot of those efforts are being squandered on men who are the least favorable. Right. Let's be, let's be charitable. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so someone like, um, do you have any examples of people that aren't getting it? Well, certainly. Uh, Bruce Harrison. Okay. Vietnam War vet, machine gunner in Vietnam. Now, this wasn't a man who was drafted. Right. He volunteered to go to Vietnam. Two combat tours, machine gunner. He was shot four times. He uh, had numerous opportunities to return home. He kept going back out into the field. But well, this man has two purple hearts, bronze star for V for, and a bronze star with V for Valor. So why, why isn't he eligible? Because while he, he was caught up in an undercover sting. Okay. Where he was paid $1,000 to unload an airplane. Okay. You know, the federal authorities were op operating a phony smuggling operation and they needed, they were targeting these guys. And quite frankly, they're just, insignificant criminals. Right. Notwithstanding how the government tries to characterize them, you know, they got knocked off for $1,000. Basically, they're baggage handling. Right. They're not trafficking in the product. Right. They have no ownership interest. They have no stake in the outcome. Right. Well, the ATF agents participating in the investigation told Hopper, Harrison, yeah. to go ahead and bring a firearm just to protect the load. So, so they encourage him to bring the very firearm that they didn't turn around and hit him with to increase his sentence. Right. So the man ends up with a 49-year sentence. 45 of them are attributed to firearms. Two of them, on two instances, he brought them at the direction of the agents. So the judge at sentencing gives him a 49-year sentence. He gets 45 for the gun, four for the drug activity. So basically the guy's looking at a nine-year sentence. Right. Like if he were sentenced today, he wouldn't get more than nine years because the first step back, another aspect of it deals with the unfairness of what they consider stacking of the 924C firearm offenses. Okay. See, today you wouldn't get the five twenty twenty. You'd just get the five. Right. So he'd have been doing nine years. He's already done 29. He's done 20 years over what his sentence would be if he were sentenced today. And they won't give him a day off. They won't give him a day off. Two Purple Hearts, Bronze Star, Every month we're hearing the list, guys getting called down, you know, chose. Right. You know, pack up your stuff, report to R&D. And it's just like, you know, we're just shaking our head because you got guys like him, you got Wayne Collimore, you know, two bronze stars, V for Valor, Purple Heart, got a guy like Kelvin Bias, numerous Army Ranger-led airborne assaults, Special Forces-led airborne assaults, targeting high-value Al-Qaeda targets. This guy has numerous confirmed kills of Al-Qaeda fighters. Won't give him a day off. What, 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 because he has a, he had a gun. Had a firearm. Had a firearm. Did, did he use the firearm? No, no one, none of the guys have used a firearm. Right, in commission you know, of the crime. In the commission of the crime. Right. You know, the, another one was the, a young Marine, Brandon Mojica. Mojica worked at Wells Fargo. Right. He knew that there was going to be a delivery of money to the bank that day. So he has one of his goofy friends come in. The guy's wearing a Groucho Marx mask. The guy's an unarmed firearm. He pulls out the firearm, waves it. Brandon's like, no, no. Right. Take the money. 
he hands over the bag of... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it took the FBI all of about 24 hours to unravel this. Right. We're not talking criminal masterminds at the first order. Right. So he gets a 10-year sentence, three of it for the bank robbery, seven for the firearm he wasn't carrying. He wasn't even carrying... Where was it? He's the, well, the co-defendant. Oh, the co-defendant had the firearm. Okay. Came in waving the firearm saying, hey, yeah, yeah. give me the money. Okay. So, right. uh, you know, so the, the courts are... The, the administration is saying, if there's a firearm in the case, you're excluded. And what's unfair about it is, you know, Trump signed it into law in December of 18. So from January 19 to January 22, that three-year period, men were earning credits. Right. Well, in January 22, the formal rules came out saying, this is how we're going to apply. So these guys are programming for three years, thinking they're, you know, they're, 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 they're right. doing the right thing. And uh, all of a sudden come January 22, None of them are called. By that, you know, by March, now we're starting to see what was bad is our warden had just recently retired, so we couldn't step to her. Like Miss Ward retired, Miss Lane retired. Right. So there was nobody that was really invested in the program. And so like our contacts were gone and we're still under operating under lockdown conditions because of COVID. And so after a couple of months, you know, we start reaching out like, hey, why aren't these men getting it? And, uh, they're saying, well, we're going to disqualify you guys because of the firearm conviction, which is a statute 18 U.S.C. 924C. Well, what was really disingenuous is for the first eight or nine months, they took the position, nobody gets it. So we're following the administrative remedies. Then they come in in September of 22, the case manager coordinator, a guy named Mullins, holds a town hall in the Veterans Reentry Program and states, look, we got your guys' complaints. The Bureau's reconsidered. We're going to give you guys the credits. So now... Everybody's calling home, crying, wives are calling, crying, you know, girlfriends are crying, everybody's all excited. A month later, they reverse gears and say, no, we've decided we're not going to give it to you. Meanwhile, they're letting all these right. weirdos coming out. Right. And so, so, and that's where the anger started to kind of boil over. And so now these matters are currently being litigated in court, but... Had the administration maintained the position they did in September of 22, all of these guys would have already obtained their credits. Mojico would have been home a year ago. Mm. So, I, so who, who, who is getting it? So the, 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 I'm going to call them chomos because there are, you know, chose, whatever. Mm -hmm. Let's just go with chose because so, you know, which chose are getting the, are, are getting it. Well, all federal prisoners who didn't have a firearm offense or a fentanyl-related offense okay. are theoretically eligible. Then there's a second exclusion where they're saying the men with offenses are excluded. Okay. Which... That sounds like that's fairly, sweeping. That's fairly across the board, right? Across the board. And unfortunately, for whatever reason, they're saying, well, even though there's a broad exclusion of no is getting any of the credits they've carved out a niche which is essentially the most egregious of the offenders right like if there's a spectrum the worst of the worst have gotten it right and that's why you know, so that's, you're saying like if, it, if it's some guy who's got some photos who, who downloaded f pictures they're he, excluded he's excluded yeah but if a guy thought he was talking to a 12 year old yeah. the, the people who actually went out to go meet a child either they're getting it either actually had physical contact one of the guys that got it kidnapped a child took him over state lines right others that get snatched when they come back when you know they're flying out of the country and when they land back and you know they take them into custody right um the majority of the guys and this is where you really have to give the fbi credit you know i'm not necessarily a big fan of law enforcement but in this particular circumstances they do a very good job where most of these men are simply getting picked up when they go to meet right what they believe is you know, a 14 year old or a 12 year old yeah and you know they show up and, and there's a detective and there's the fbi agent they just roll them right into custody but then they come to prison and many of them weren't even really participating in the programming because everybody was operating under the assumption that they're ineligible. Right. And so where they got a bit of a windfall was because of COVID. As a result of 
the BOP system being essentially on lockdown, modified operations for two years, the Bureau has been pretty generous in saying, as long as you didn't get in trouble during those two years, we're going to award the credits to you because there simply wasn't an opportunity for you to program. Okay. Is there anything, right. whereas the guys in veterans reentry, they programmed the entire time. Right. Because we had a residential based unit, you know, the men are just. Yeah, you didn't have to go anywhere. It was in the unit. They didn't have right. to go to the library and take classes at night. Yep. They, it was there just because it's in the unit. Yeah. So, like the psychologists would come over for, you know, family planning. Right. And then another one would come over for national parenting, you know, all these programs that they were running. And so, you know, because we had a little bit of a ball busting prick counselor right. who insisted upon people participating in the programs, you know, they were signing up. Right. So now at the end of that two year period where COVID was now phased out, all of a sudden the bureau saying, you know what, we're going to give you guys the credit. Suddenly you got guys coming in like, wow, I'm going home. Whereas the ones who were actually sincerely programming got their release plans in order. We pushed through their transitional housing. They got their credit repaired. They literally got jobs already lined up. Yeah, they, they've served time in the military. They, they, well, that's, that's basically how it was so easy because employers, remember back in 2019 when Trump kind of had the economy hitting on all cylinders? Right. Employers were coming and hiring people right out of the prison. Right. I mean, we're getting literally like an email from McDonnell Douglas or an email from Raytheon. We're looking for these guys with the men with these type of prior military experience. Because what they're getting is they're getting somebody who's already trained, getting out of prison, back at square one, so he's going to be hungry. Right. And he's on probation. Yeah. He's showing up. He's showing up. He's not going to do anything foolish. Also, because of the tax credit aspect. It's, it's a, there's an incentive for them an incentive to hire a felon. To hire a felon, because now they're essentially hiring the guy. They're getting paid to hire somebody who's already been trained by somebody else. Right. All of the men, know, they, you know, in the military, they're taught, you know, pay attention to detail. How to, everybody understands the chain of command. Everybody understands standing orders. Everybody understands you got to, you know, teamwork. So these are qualities that employers are looking for. Right. They can follow, they can follow directions. This is I mean, cause I, I had a couple of guys at, <laughs> at the mortgage brokerage business. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I remember when I, they came in, to, they never, they got their licenses to be loan officers or mortgage brokers. They were constantly like, well, is there like a manual? Mm -hmm. I was like, no, there's no manual. I'm going to, we're going to go over it. They're like, was well, there a, do you have like a, a guidebook. I'm like, no, we're going to go over how to do it. Sit down. Yeah. They, you know, they're looking for a protocol. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're looking. Yeah, exactly. They're looking for a step by step. Yeah. Um, we built that for each one of the uh, workshops has a separate protocol. So men may not need the services. In which case, great. Then you get a quiet, clean, respectful place to live. You came over to the unit many times. You saw yeah. how it was. Yeah, it was super. It was, it was the best. It was the best. That and the RDAP unit were the best units uh, in the whole prison. Yeah, but see, RDAP, the guys are compelled to participate. They're terrified. They have to. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. trying to. And yeah. they're getting time off. Yeah. Whereas with veterans reentry, you're not getting any time off. It's like, you know. No, no. They're just they're just well behaved because they want to be well behaved because that's just who they are as people as opposed to the RDAP people who are terrified into behaving well because they yeah, don't want to While they're kicked, in the program. Right. They don't want to get kicked out of the program because they're getting a year off their, their yeah. sentence. So um, remember I even joked about, I, I was like, man, I wish I could get in here. I, I even joked about uh, falsifying. Their, so when, you, when you're released from the military, they give you a, a, a certificate that basically, it's called a DD-214. I was like, like if I could get a hold of one and fake it. <laughs> I was like, I, I could send it in. And you were like, they're, they're going to check. They're going to check. <laughs> yeah. So what are you doing? Because it was so nice, so clean, so quiet. Everybody was very respectful. It was just like a great unit to be in. It didn't work out. So. Yeah. Got talked out of that. <laughs> um, okay. So, so I want to know who is getting released. Can we, you want to get, you want to talk about that? Who is being released? Like, you know, who are, who are some of these guys? Well, for instance, let's take a look at this guy right here. Okay, this guy. This is David Thompson. Wow. Mr. Okay. Thompson just got a sentence reduction of one year and extended halfway house placement. Oh, that's nice. What did he do? Well, Mr. Thompson was an administrator at a school. Oh, school and teacher. <laughs> he would travel out of the country, fly down to Belize, where he would interact with young children. Mm. And upon one of his returns back, the authorities were waiting for him. Mm. He was recruiting young 
Yeah, yeah. Minors. Yeah, yeah minors. Through Facebook, grooming them. And then, fortunately, when he returned, they caught him, knocked him off. I mean, look, let's, let's, let's look. Look at this. Come on, let's, I honestly, look at this guy. This is exactly, this is, this is the prototype, prototypical, <laughs> you know, Cho. Yes, it is. So. Okay, we have a second guy who's uh, terrible. <laughs> you want to show the picture? Who, oh, who this yep. is, oh. This is Gary Goldberg. Mr. Goldberg was arrested after maintaining relations with two minors. He was a real estate agent too, by the way. He was Remember a, that? Yes. And him, Doesn't say a lot for, for real estate agents. I'm just saying. Yes. He would entice the teenage girls to participating in this activity by giving them money, drugs, and alcohol. So he's got, you know, adolescent minors strung out on cocaine while he was doing what he was doing. And fortunately, the FBI were able to step in and knock this scumbag off. Right. And he got, he got out what? He, well, he's gotten his credits. And uh, last year, in fact, last February, Goldberg was awarded his FSA time credits and received an early release from prison. Okay. Now the guy that's in, spent two years in Afghanistan, you know, in an army of ranger led airborne assaults, he gets turned down. He gets nothing. But the, the, the principal, oh, the principal yeah. uh, engaging in untoward activities with minors. Yeah. Listen, you've, you've gone so, you've, you've, you've been, you haven't curbed your, your well, uh, use of, of any of the words at all. What? I, I thought my, my best behavior. <laughs> so what, who else, what, what, we'll who, who are we looking three. at now? Let's go to number three. All right. Okay. This guy. Huh? This guy? Michael Chemileski. He worked at the Florida State House. He was the individual responsible for giving minors tours at a state house. So, oh, that was, you know, that was, uh, I propose, <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a this, perfect job for him. Yes. Yeah. And so he had quite a bit of access and interactions and same situation, you know, they just, it's compulsive behavior. Yeah. Yeah. No, they, they they're always, not, they're not going to stop. Yeah. They always tend to tend to go for like, they always tend to be teachers or they work at a kindergarten or mm -hmm. they work at, you know, it's always some weird not always, but a lot of times it's, they, yeah. they put themselves in a position to when he arrived, take advantage. When he arrived at the Walgreens for his rendezvous. <laughs> How disappointed was he? He thought it, he thought it was a 12-year-old you know, girl or boy, and it turned out to be a pissed off 45-year-old <laughs> FBI agent. That had to be disappointing. <laughs> he got his heart broken and everything. <laughs> and he got 10 years. And then Biden came along and said, ah, we're going to let you out a little bit early. Um. So he got he got a chunk off, or we're waiting to make his determination. Oh, okay, but he's getting yes, yeah, he will get time off. Okay, what about now, this, this guy? guy? He was awarded his FSA credits last year, and given the number of credits he had, he was what granted. Was his, name? his name is Ronald Grokoff. He, oh, okay. he received an immediate release. Immediate release. Immediate release. Immediately release. Yes. Okay. Prior to his arrest, Mr. Grokoff was a doctor. Oh, man. And he was uh, negotiating with an undercover FBI agent who had been pretending to be the parent of a young child who was asking Mr. Grokoff to initiate activity with the child. So when so Grokoff thought, showed, he was, thought he was talking to a parent that was selling their child. Yes. Mm. What, was the, what was the doctor, the, um, the uh, was it the, uh, the Olympics, uh, you know, the, the gymnast doctor? Mm -hmm. Essentially like that, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So, and, well, let's see. and he got immediate release. Okay. So yes. now another individual you're here, Mr. Ashy, like Mr. Grokoff and Mr. Good, he was arrested by the authorities after he attempted to lure a young minor into engaging in activity. He was released 16 months ago. And so, and so the men in the unit, it's like, again, you're watching these guys leaving and it's like, you know, this guy's got gunshot wounds in him. Right. For being in Afghanistan. For being in Afghanistan, being, being in Iraq. He got someone like Mohika on his arm and shoulders. He has tattoos of the initials of every one of his friends that was killed. All you see are letters everywhere. Right. Everything is covered. He came back as a 23-year-old, having buried over a dozen of his friends. He gets nothing. He gets nothing. Okay. What about this guy? <sighs> One of the worst. Russell Hardman. 
Mm. He's the one with the issue and uh, the toddlers. Oh, okay. And the videos, and he left a couple weeks ago. He's been released in the last month. This guy here, Rapey Dave. He's been released in the last month. So the the so the inmates give these guys nicknames. Sure. A lot of them have nicknames. Uh, yes, uh, nobody yeah. refers to them by their right. by their given name. So this guy is a we got a rapey day. What, what was the other guy's name? Shitty boo boo. Shitty boo boo. I mean, just banger. I mean, so okay. Yeah. Um, who else? What else? What? Who else have we got? Uh where the, yeah, oh, okay. is it just this guy? Well, and what's, what's even more shocking. Okay, this, yeah, yeah. Perhaps the most egregious of the entire issue. All right. Not only are the worst of the worst being afforded this opportunity when the men with prior military service are being denied, they're even going out of their way to give credits to those men who are back in prison on their second defense. Right. And so on the very day that Three guys got denied their credits. Mojica, Baez, Mitchell, you know, Marine, Army Ranger, Navy Special Forces. This scumbag comes marching into my office. A banger. Twice convicted Cho. What's his name? What's? Ken Hanger. Hanger. Hence, banger. Right. And twice convicted Cho. Comes, you know, comes to federal prison, serves a sentence, out on supervised release, catches a second show offense. Okay. He's back in federal prison, has the nerve to show up at my office because he needs boxes to start mailing stuff out. I'm like, well, for what? Yo, I got my credits today. Taking a year off my sentence, getting extended halfway house. In fact, they awarded him so many credits that he wanted to know if he can get his supervised release, re apply those to lower his supervised release. Right. So I asked him, well, how long is your supervised release? He said, well, the judge gave me life. I said, well, no. <laughs> well, no, there's no you're reduction You're not going to get out from underneath a life supervised release. Right. Now, once a federal judge has how made a determination. Yeah, how egregious yes. is your crime that you get a life? And so when the judge says, you, are, you pose such a threat. Right. That we're going to keep you on this extreme extremely tight leash for the rest of your life. Meanwhile, this administration is going out of their way to push men like this out of prison right. while denying the guys with the Purple Hearts. Right. You know, and that's when it's like, okay, at that point is, you know, and this was shortly before I was leaving. And uh, after I left, you know, well, in the run-up to my leaving, we had a bias took over as the coordinator for the program. And that's when he came to me, he's like, look, we need a voice. Right. Those are and guys like Baby Banger out. Like someone has to speak up on behalf of us, which right. is why I actually agreed to come, come on, on your podcast. Yeah, yeah. Anybody watching this that could share the video to anybody that they feel, even if they, cause here's the thing. Like I, my dad used to always say this is that, you know, look, you may not know the person that you want to get in contact that could help you, mm -hmm. but you know somebody that might know somebody that knows somebody that might know that guy. So yeah. anybody that thinks, hey, you know what? I know John, and I know John knows somebody at the Bureau of Prisons or at the FBI or at the U.S. Attorney's Office or at the, you know, in Washington. Like, if anybody thinks, hey, I know somebody that knows somebody, then d share the video and try and get this to that person, into that person's hands. Mm -hmm. Because let's face it, a lot of people in the whole system may not even know this is, this is happening at all. Because I'm sure that the, the shows aren't running around talking about it. They're not bragging about mm -hmm. it, right? Like they're not. Well, because, you know, I was, in addition to being responsible for the program, I also served as the clerk. Right. So they had to come to me to get, you know, boxes or get the tape to mail their stuff out. And it's like, why are all these yeah. really squirrely people all of a sudden packing up their stuff? And so, of course, they have to come to me and come say, like, what do you need the boxes for? I'm not just going to give them to shows. Well, I'm shipping all my stuff. Like, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, well, here's the thing. The, after we got the new warden, I went and I stepped to the guy. Right. You know, pretty decent guy. And he's like, look, these decisions are made in D.C. He says, we don't have any authority on who's going to get it or not. We're not making those determinations. We're not exercising that discretion. He says, we receive guidance. We just apply the guidance. He's like, so he's not, he's not discouraging people from filing the administrative remedies. 
But on the other hand, there are so many people. You know, we filed a, a habeas action for Mojica last spring, spring of 23, before I left prison. Still hasn't been resolved. There are literally thousands of these petitions stuck in federal courts to the point where the judges just simply don't have the ability to push through all of this. Right. Now, an administrative change by the administration where they're saying, hey, look, you know, and the reasonable solution that they had in September of 22 was that during the seven-year period you got for the firearm or the five-year period or the 10-year period, you can't apply your credits. Right. So you program for 10 years, discharge that sentence, because when you receive a 10-year sentence, it's not a 10-year sentence. It's a three-year sentence and a seven-year sentence. Right. Or a five and five. Each count of conviction is a standalone sentence. So while the firearm sentence is being served, the man can't apply the credits. Once he discharges that sentence, let him apply it. Right. And that was the decision that they made in September of 22. For whatever reason, they took that back and they said, no, if there's a firearm in anywhere in the case, we're just going to exclude you. And so the solution is relatively simple. Just go back to the prior policy that you guys had in place for about a month. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't require an act of Congress. It's, right. just, it's just a, a determination of, or a, um, them just looking at it and saying, hey, let's just reverse this decision. That could be mm -hmm. administrated, right? Yes, like, the Department of Justice could easily say, We've changed our tune. We're going to go back to this. We're going to go back to this. And right. what's particularly disheartening is for decades, the same Department of Justice would say, well, the 924C count has to be served first. Right. Because they were using it to block men from participating in other recidivism reduction programs that get sentence reductions. Right. But now that all of a sudden the First Step Act was put in place, they're reversing gears and saying, no, 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 you got to serve that last. <laughs> that forecloses them from catching it on the back end. Right. And so all they need to do is just, for instance, you know, men that are stuck in Florida are under the 11th Circuit's law. The 11th Circuit's got a whole body of case law where they're saying 924C must be served first. And so hopefully the judge in someone like Mojica's case says, hey, look, we've got 30 years of precedent. We're going to let the kid do his 924C first, at which point he completed it, give him his credits. He, like I said, he'd have been home last year. No reason for someone like that. Or Baez. You know, Harrison's 75-year-old man. Right. You know, he's falling apart. Mr. Collimore, 76, 77. These are, you know, guys that are in their 70s and 80s. Old Vietnam War vets. Look, these men don't pose a threat right harrison and i were responsible for we were what they refer to as the flag detail every morning and every evening we had to go out raise the flag and lower the flag it would take harrison about five minutes to go to 70 yards from our unit to the compound shack to get to the flagpole right i mean just yeah he's he's just broke down you know his knees yeah, are bad his feet are bad this is his him. hip it, is bad in and this was 10 years ago. That's a 10 year old picture. 10 yeah. years old. This is with his grandchildren in the visitation room. Yeah. Like I said, two purple hearts shot four times. You know, he can, he's barely mobile. Now, obviously the government's going to say, well, when he was a younger man, he was a hellraiser. Sure. 30 years ago. Yeah. He's 40 he's, years yeah. ago. Yeah. He's now he's, I mean, you know, they call him Hopper. Yes. Yeah, right. Like, I mean, I saw Hopper all the time walking around, you know, and even, even then, that was what five six five six years ago. He mm -hmm. even then he, you know, he's got that hunch kind of little hunch kind of, you know, he he wobbles. Yes, you know, he's not. It's not like he's he's in great shape. And it just degenerated. Yeah, and you know he's going blind in one eye, early onset of Alzheimer's. This is like a manifestation of numerous medical conditions all coming together to say, look, the seventy five year old man poses no threat. You could literally release him tomorrow. You'd never hear from him again. No, He'd he never be in any him, trouble. Let him enjoy He'd, his sunset years. Right, with his with, grandkids. With his grandkids right. and his family. Right. Man, and, been in prison for 30 years for an offense that, like I said, if he were sentenced today, he'd have gotten nine years. But there's just, the He's 30 years into what should be a nine-year sentence. Right. So the problem is that, and what people don't understand is that, um, uh, was it Clinton that closed that, that loophole, that they no longer allow you to go back and correct your sentence? You have one year. You have, what, one year to do... Um, to follow then, a habeas to, action. Right. And so you're time barred. After one year, yeah. you got what you got. Yeah. Unless there's completely new evidence in your case. And in his case, 
He's got 45 years? Well, he has a 45-year sentence, and well, you're allowed to challenge the conviction or challenge the sentence within one year. One year. From the date of your appeal being denied. Okay. Now, on the First Step Act, there is a provision that theoretically could apply. Okay. That will say, well, we'll allow a sentence modification. Right. But then again, you're going back to the court and you're going back to the prosecutor. Right. Prosecutors. Yeah, they, they, they don't. They, they don't, fight no matter what. Yeah, no matter what they put up. Because a fight. for their. They don't want you to get one day off. Well, you know, look, like I said, when the man got charged back in 1994, he may have been causing a little bit of, you know, mischief. Right. No, I get that. But that's but, why you guys, but, why I went to prison. That's, that's why. So now when it's 30 years later, the prosecutor is acting like it's 94. Right. Like this is a broke down old yeah. man who's falling apart. Yeah, you were you were you were sentencing a, a guy in his late twenties or thirties or whatever, for early forties or so. Yeah, so you were sentencing a guy that was still po potentially dangerous. Like this is a completely different individual now. That's right. And what is it? Pepper says that you can when they get resentenced, you're allowed to consider the person that you're currently yes. sentencing and not the person that committed the crime. Yeah, it was a Supreme Court case by right. you know called Pepper versus United States in 2011, which said that in the event you get resentenced, right, then you can take into consideration post conviction rehabilitation. But in that, that's conditional, predicated upon you can actually get back into court. Right, which is virtually impossible. But these guys can't get back into court. Right. And so we're going to be, well, he's going to be filing a compassionate release motion seeking to obtain a sentence modification. The but government could easily take the position saying, you know what, release him. Right. Or at least allow his prior military service to weigh heavily in favor, particularly given the fact that he started out in maximum security, came down to a low, maintained clear institutional record, demonstrated sincere desire for rehabilitation, programming, helps with the program, helps, not only is he participating in programs, he helps with running the program and he mentors a lot of the young guys. Right. Because they look at him and he's a famous guy, he's got a lot of notoriety from when he was younger. Now, he's like, look, this keep your nose clean. Fun. Right. Because quite frankly, you could easily end up with a 40 year sentence, 30 year sentence. You know, the man's been down for 30, so highly decorated war hero like that. He really makes an impact when he's instructing the younger guys, hey man, cut out the bullshit. You know, right. people respect him. Right. No one ever gets out of the line with Hopper or any of the other older men like that. Right. So Hopper, when I was there, he, you know, basically he got sentenced, like, like we were talking about, you know, he, he didn't really have much at that time when I, because I was there before the, the First Step Act was signed into, into law. He, you know, he had exhausted all his appeals. He had exhausted everything as far as I knew. And I remember there was a Cho that was doing legal work and his name was, was Kelly Riggs. Okay. So that's the story that I remember with Hopper. Because I was there when everybody was saying, and it, you know, you've corrected me since then, but this is what guys were saying. They were like, bro, like there's a bunch of motorcycles, you know, out in the parking lot and they're revving their, you know, revving their thing and they're, they're waiting for Hopper to get released. And then as the day progressed, it suddenly you realize like Hopper wasn't getting released. Then it got trickled down like, bro, you, did you hear about Hopper? Did you hear about Hopper? Like, no, like I got multiple people telling me, bro, he thought he was, he thought he was being released. He's not being released. And so all of that is as a result of, of Kelly Riggs. And you were, you were, or you were ended up getting thrown into that. You know more about that story. I've actually told this story briefly on mm -hmm. a couple of like real quickly, cause I don't know the exact in the out. But you ended up kind of getting, in, not involved, but you know more because you ended up helping Hopper, looking over his stuff, talking to Frank Amadeo about uh, Hopper's uh, legal work and stuff. So you know more about exactly what happened. Can you kind of explain that story with, uh, with Riggs? Well, when Riggs first arrived, Riggs had previously been in the service. So once he hits the compound, he gets sent to the unit. Now we had a counselor who could be a little bit of a ball busting prick right but he was solid if you were a stand-up guy right and so the way the system was set up you know i was his essentially the guy running the program right. and so a couple of days beforehand he'd tell me hey we're gonna have a new guy coming off the bus piece of fucking shit <laughs> and that's all i needed to know right, like right. okay or he'll be a hey man who's a good dude right hook him up 
And so, you know, if you had, you know, respectable charges, definitely weren't a Cho. Right. You know, if you weren't a piece of shit, if you were just a solid guy, came down from the pen, you know, been down for 15 years, been tw down for 20 years, the guy's going to look out for you. Right. Guys like this had absolutely nothing coming. And so because it was a program unit, held 170 men, he ran about 165, 166. He kept it pretty full. And so he had taken one of the activities room and he had converted into like a little dormitory. And that's what was generally referred to as the fishbowl. And guys like Riggs would get plopped into the fishbowl. So you'd have 10 of them living together, just horrible on top of each other, no privacy, just very uncomfortable circumstances. Well, at this particular point, we had an overflow because we had over 10 shows. And so the guys that were the overflow went to the bath, went to the cells by the bathrooms. And so when Riggs showed up, I already knew he was on piece of shit status. So I'm giving him the uh, informal walkthrough, you know, giving him the explanation is how the programs ran, is his expectations, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so I asked him, hey, do you mind if I ask you what your charges are? And he's like, well, why do you want to know? I said, well, because I have to, part of my responsibility is making sure that the cellmates are compatible. Right. Said, and uh, now I knew he was army. He said, well, I've got a law enforcement background. But you already knew he's, you're, yeah, yeah, you yes, already yes. knew. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. But you so, don't want to say, just, I already know what your charges are. Well, right. Yeah. Well, one, I'm not supposed to know. Right. And secondly, I'm just bidding off this guy at this point, because now right. here he comes in with this whole story about how he was a uh, former law enforcement while he was in the service, he had a, he was going legal background and uh, he got roped into some classified type projects. And uh, so when he got released, he got involved in arms trafficking because he had his contacts in the service. So it was military grade weapons. I'm like, oh, really? He's like, yeah. So while he's working with the CIA, he stumbles upon a Mexican cartel smuggling operation. I thought you were going to say a 14 year old. <laughs> And now I'm here. It's crazy. <laughs> that is crazy. So <laughs> you'll be next to the bathroom. So long story short, he claims to be trafficking in weapons, stumbles onto this drug operation. He's working with the FBI as an undercover operative, trying to take down these rogue DEA agents. And uh, the authorities ultimately double cross him, smashed him, and uh, he got framed and got railroaded, and now he's in federal prison. And I'm just like, wow. Because most like you know, a lot of the guys, a lot of these guys that show up, yeah, they'll lie and claim that you know they're fraudsters. Yeah. Oh, I hated that. It's like pick someone else's crime. Like you, they always go with fraud. Yeah. Well, because look, no one's gonna look at this guy and say, okay, well, you're moving big weight. Right. right. You're not a drug trafficker. <laughs> right. You know, and you weren't robbing banks, and you're not even an arms trafficker. However, with the fraud guy, they can come in with you know mortgage fraud. Yeah, and, and most there's not a lot of people with that, so a lot of people can't question them too much. Well, and the majority of the guys tend to be a little older. They're first time down, so they don't have any established record. So it's like, well, this is my first prison. So right. it's like nobody can like cross you. Right. Whereas like, yeah, you know, I started at USP Leavenworth. Well, there's guys on the yard. Yeah, yeah, he was there at Leavenworth. Right. Or he was there at Atwater. And so there's a way to vet non-new arrivals. Well, a guy like this who just got into the system, he uh, has no background other than what's presented. And so when counselor says, he's a piece of fucking shit, yeah. that's basically letting us know, hey, all the normal guys. Right. You know, when you see a guy like this show up in front of the shitters, that's where he got put. The right. Like, okay, you're such a lying sack. We're putting you right in front of the shitters. And uh, he wasn't too happy about it. Right. <laughs> and so after a few days, he's like, well, any chance that I can get moved? And I'm like, well, 166, 167 men in the unit. There's never really any place to put you. And he's like, oh, okay. I said, but I'll put you on the list. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he wants an ego, extra legal locker. Yeah, yeah, I'll put you on the list. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't say no. Yeah. But you're going on the list. But none of them ever move off the list. No. <laughs> and uh, after a couple of weeks, he's like, you know what? I'm going to leave the unit. And see, the problem for a man like this is he shows up and he came to my office a couple of days after getting there because he does legal work, he said. So I already know the guy's full of it with yeah. respect to his charges. So now I'm like, really? And so he's explaining to me what his habeas action is 2255 challenging his conviction. And he's telling me he's, challenging, he's bringing this claim, this claim, that claim. And I'm like, well, the first claim is procedurally defaulted. Second, second claim is procedurally barred. Third claim isn't even cognizable in the 11th Circuit. Like, what are you doing, man? Right. Like, you obviously have no idea what you're talking about. And over the course of 
about a week, he'd gone around to some of the men in the unit, like the older guys, guys that have been, you know, a man like Hopper has been down for 15, 20 years, and they know they have nothing coming. And so a guy like this comes in and starts selling hope, false yeah. hope. To someone now, who's desperate. You know, other than Frank Amadeo, I didn't know any other individual, any other prisoner in the system that achieved a measure of success I did litigating claims on behalf of other inmates. Right. And so I uh, immediately knew that this guy doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. And every man in the unit understood that if you've got any legal questions, just come to me. Right. And I've discussed these issues with all these older guys. They're like, look, there's nothing cognizable at this point. Let's be reasonable. Let's wait. Because what you don't want to keep doing is filing papers in court. Because all you're doing is digging a bigger hole. Yeah. Because now you're going to have to overcome a second default, a triple default. Pretty soon it's just ins insurmountable. Right. And, you know, desperate men do desperate things. And so for a charlatan like this, he shows up. And he starts feeding them this nonsense. So guys start coming to me, older guys, like, hey, this guy said he can get me back into court. I'm like, it's not possible, Wayne. What are you doing, man? Like, right. if, we, if I can get you back into court, I'm getting you into court. Right. You know, I'm getting guys relief frequently. Right. A couple of your buddies, a couple of guys from A1, one of the guys from A2. Like, you know, the law is mechanical. And if there's a claim that's available, we assert it at the appropriate time. Well, a guy like this comes in and he's able to capitalize on the ignorance of other inmates. And so I had about probably a good half a dozen solid guys come to me. And so finally I had to pull this scumbag into the office and say, look, man, cut it out. You don't know what you're talking about. You're getting all these guys worked up. You know, I ain't some broke dick joker. I don't need to sell bullshit to some guy for a couple hundred bucks. Right. I said, stop it. And so right after that, he goes and talks to the counselor to get moved out of the unit. Now, because he was in a program unit, he had to go to another program unit. And the only program unit he can go to was the one upstairs in A4. A little the bullshit ass free, free program. program. Yeah. And so, fast forward now to late 2017, Hopper shows up. Now, when he arrives, a day or two beforehand, counselor's, hey man, solid dude showing up. Hook him up. And so, of course, we're going to look out for someone like a Hopper. Right. He's going to get one of the good cells. He's going to get, you know, a new mattress, new locker, whatever job assignment he needs help. Boom, I'll go talk to people, get him situated. Basically, everything you can do to help a man who's been down for 20 plus years and has that respect coming. You're going to go out of your way to help the guy out. And so, unfortunately, when he arrives, again, we're at 166, 167. There's no beds that are available. And in our unit, a lot of the men had prior combat experience. So even when you see, you know, normally you won't have a 30 year old in a bottom bunk. Yeah, but this guy's been, he's hit two IEDs in Iraq. Right. You know what I mean? He's had three surgeries, he can barely walk. So you've got the men that are in the bottom bunks actually have bottom bunk passes. Right. And so when Hopper showed up, you know, I'm walking him through the program and I'm like, look, we got three cells that are available. None of them were, you know, the, what's called the privileged housing. No, right. the preferred housing. And uh, so you're going into a three-man cell that was designed for two men. Two of them had top bunks. You can't put a 70-year-old man on a top bunk. Right. And unfortunately, like the one cell where there was a bottom bunk, the other guy was a fender. He's like, man, you can't put me in a cell. With right. You know, the other guy... There was a top bunk, and I'm like, well, I can put the, I can just, you know, move this guy, move him to the top, because he's only like 40 years old. He's like, one, I don't want to wreck anybody's program. Two, can't put him in a cell with a cop. You know, he used to be a police officer. Right. <laughs> and so I was like, okay. He's like, well, are there any options besides this? He's like, I got one of my brothers on the yard. Can I move to the other unit? I said, look, you're in a program unit. You got to go from this unit to another program. Well, he didn't want to go to Unicor. He couldn't go to RDAP. And so we got a little bullshit program upstairs. I go, we'll, we'll go check it out. Long story short, he goes upstairs, finds some of his buddies from the medium. He's like, you know what, I'll just stay here. When something opens up downstairs, you know, let me know. He'll come back down and go to, you know, a decent cell. Because he wasn't the kind of guy that's going to go to the counselor and say, wreck another man's program to accommodate me. Right. Even if it's a show, even if it's a former police officer, you know, because the unit had, it's all former military guys, there was a high concentration of former officers. So, you know, at any given time, you might have 
you know, 10, 15, 20 cops. Right. You know, a crooked cop out of Detroit, crooked cop out of Chicago. They send them to this program because of their military experience. And so he's like, look, I ain't wrecking anybody's program. Just move me upstairs. So he goes upstairs. And who's living upstairs at this point? Riggs. And of course, Riggs, former army. <laughs> not, not a show. It was, it was yeah, not a right. show. You know, and at this point, so he invites Hopper to move in with him. Hopper doesn't know any better because the guys upstairs don't live in our unit and didn't see that he's moving by the bathrooms. Right. See, every normal guy in our unit like, oh, okay. Right. He's by the bathrooms. He's one of them. Whereas the guys upstairs, they're listening to him, arms trafficking, army, right. military-grade equipment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a, a, a guy like this, when he starts dropping big terms, it intimidates a lot of the other prisoners who simply can't challenge the man. Right. So he starts throwing around legal phrases and like, oh, he's a jailhouse lawyer. And so by the time Hopper arrives, this guy's got a whole number of guys upstairs he's already doing legal work for. He's charging them anywhere from like 200 to 1500 bucks. And uh, he focused on the guys in his unit and then out on the compound, see, someone like myself, I'm not going to get involved in assisting someone with a sex offense type case. I'm right. not going to spend hundreds of hours racking my brain, putting together a claim to get somebody that a nine-year-old out Five years early, excuse me, five years early. Right. Like we're, not, we're not doing that. And so they're, those guys have a very difficult time finding help. And so he was focusing his efforts on those kind of guys. And uh, so he was targeting primarily Hispanic guys who are foreign nationals, very little English skills, not right. very sophisticated. Same thing with offenders, no prior criminal experience. These are just fishes in prison for the first time, not very sophisticated. So the guy builds his whole clientele up. Well, he's got Hopper for a cellmate, and he, of course, starts selling Hopper the same type of false hope. And again, for a man who's been down for 20 years, you're like, okay, well, if you can do this, yeah, sure, no problem. Now, the thing about Hopper is he was, as a younger man, a rather legendary member of the Outlaw Motorcycle Club. Right. This is one of the largest clubs in the United States, the very first club to have formed. And he was out of the Midwest, came from the, you know, the mother chapter, came down to Florida. You know, he knew everybody in the state of Florida within that particular circle. And so up and down the East Coast, everybody knows who he is. So when he shows up at a prison, hey, what's going on, Hop? You know, he's just really embraced. Right. And uh, he's got a very compelling story. No, you've written a number of great stories in prison because you wrote true crime. Right. Well, this jackass decides, you know what? He's going to glom on to something that you started. And because he's got Hopper for a cellmate, he now pitches Hop on the idea saying, hey, look, let me tell your story and I'll do your legal work for free. Because he's charging other guys up in the unit, $1,500, bucks, $2,000. So I'm like, wow, this is a good deal. Of course, Hopper doesn't have any idea that what the guy is telling him is incognizable. And so that began their relationship as they were cellmates. So now Hopper's sharing with him the details of his story while this guy's preparing his claims. So when Hopper moves in as of January 18, they spend basically the next six months working on Hopper's claim and Hopper's story. Right. And the thing that Riggs understands, because although he wasn't competent to bring claims, as evidenced by the manner in which his own 2255 got denied, procedurally right. barred, procedurally defaulted, yeah. not even cognizable. Right. He doesn't know what he's doing. He has no idea what he's doing because he's bringing claims that aren't even valid for himself. Well, what's, what's funny is that I, I've always joked around that, you know, you can, the problem, one of the problems for guys in prison is that you could basically write, like I used to say, you know, you could write a, a nice guy motion mm -hmm. in green crown mm -hmm. and send it in. And instead of the court coming back saying, this is gibberish, there's no such thing as a nice guy motion. Yeah. There's no, you know, why'd you write it in crime? You know, what, none of this makes any sense. You know, all of your case law is, is, is wrong. Like instead what they'll do is they'll, 
they actually respond to it like it's a legitimate motion. Like, yeah. you know, we are now responding to the nice guy motion filed by Mr. Cox, where he says he should get a sentence reduced because he's really a nice guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, he cite, you know, and then then the U.S. attorney, they'll give the they'll give the um, the U.S. attorney, you know, 60 days to respond and they'll respond, you know, and they'll do the same thing. They'll ask for an extra 60 days. Mm-hmm. They'll respond saying based on the nice guy motion that Mr. Cox, and they'll go through and, you know, they'll, they'll craft an entire rebuttal to the motion you'll go through the whole proceeding thinking man i'm gonna get something i'm close they take it they make you think you have a chance because they go through the process so if you're just some inmate and you don't have a clue then you think man i'm getting traction they're responding they're taking this seriously the truth is you you didn't have a prayer yeah well a guy like that can tell the man hey look we the courts accepted the claim directed the government to respond and so now he can walk around with that order. I'm in. I'm back in court. Right. Not realizing that, look, this is all just a charade. Right. The court treats it with a level of respect it doesn't merit because the court's actually going to use this later on to bar you from any subsequent action. Right. All right. The prosecutor treats it with the respect it doesn't merit because now they're saying, okay, you've just defaulted all your other claims. And so everybody's pretending that this guy is knocking it out of the park. Whereas a guy like this then is running around showing everybody, I got so-and-so back in the court after he's been down for 20 years. Right. And nobody else realizes that, you know, it's just all smoke and mirrors. Right. And so, unfortunately, he not only hopped, he roped in Hopper, he roped in another guy, uh, another guy that had been down for 20 some odd years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Stu. Stu was you know, one, one, one of my, one of my uh, old sellies yes. who, who, he'd been in and out of prison his entire life. Yes. One, I was, I always joke about this. I think you've heard me say this, Colby. Stu has been shot three times, twice by himself. (laughs) He was a robber and he would go and rob drug dealers and he'd have a gun, he'd run up and he'd grab them. And if they tried to pull away or anything, he'd pull the trigger, shot himself once in the arm, shot himself once, I think in the hand. And then one time he got shot in the leg because- he was going to rob the same guys again and they saw him coming and they just started shooting at him yeah. and, it, and it hit him in the leg. And then when he, he goes to jail, gets out, goes to the halfway house. Did you hear this one? Mm-hmm. Goes to the halfway house. While he's in the halfway house, a couple of guys convince him, because he's robbed banks before, convince him to rob a bank with him. So they say, yeah, 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 we'll rob the bank. Like you go in, rob the bank, we'll drive the car. But the truth is it's all a setup. Yeah. He gets in the car. They drive to the bank. He jumps out, goes in the bank. Like the door's locked. The <laughs> cops pull up. They jump out with the guns. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. Two guys just set them up. They get their time reduced or yeah. off probation or whatever whatever their goal was. He goes back to jail for like 20 years. I mean, this guy's literally... Did it 20 years, you know, on 20 years, he did maybe whatever, 10. Then he goes back to prison. He did, gets another 20 years. He gets, what, well, does 15 or so. Yeah. Then he goes back to this. That, and last time he got like 30 something years or something. It was ridiculous. Yeah. He ended up doing about 30 years total. Yeah. And he can't, he can't read. He's got like a, like I've, I've read his paperwork. He has a below 80 IQ. He cannot read. That was one of the things, one of the defenses by his lawyer was like, look, this guy is mentally, you know, ineffective. Like he's, he's. He, he's got like literally he's got a less than 80 IQ can't read can't write like you gotta you can't give him the full you can't give him the full sentence you gotta give him a little bit of a reduction no not interested <laughs> all the more reason to never let him out so anyway and so yes yeah, so unfortunately Riggs sunk was able to sink his teeth into these guys right. and well Stewart and Stewart had money Stewart had money See, somebody in his family yeah Stewart go didn't have a, a story so he got hit for however many you know, thousands of dollars Riggs right. hit him for. Right. And so in the run up to the day that Riggs leaves the yard, he's got everybody convinced that Hopper's going home. So how many people has he, how many people has Riggs got? Well, total? in his unit alone, at a, up in A4, Riggs checked in on July 17th, 2018. Checking in is where the inmate leaves the compound, goes to the lieutenant's office and say, hey, I need to be put in protective custody. Right that they'll remove him from the compound for his own safety. And so on July 16th, the day before, he's got Hopper convinced he's leaving. Right. Hopper literally gives away all his stuff. He's looking out for the other guys, like, here, you need some bowls, you need some sweats, here, you can have my watch, here, you can have my radio. And he thinks he's going home. He's, he's going home. 
And same thing with Stu. Stu gives away everything. Yeah, I remember I remember being in the unit and guys were, I remember guys were coming up to me. She was, this guy slow motion came up to me. He was like, yo, bro, you know, Stu's leaving. I go, no, he's not. And he goes, and he, I'm like, he's got like 15 more years. He's not going, or 10 more years or something. And then he's like, no, bro, he files it. Like, he's going home. And I was like, no. And I kept, and, and then somebody else comes to me and says, He's going home. Then Stu tries to give me something. Like he was t- telling me like, hey man, uh, you need anything here? You need, I'm like, no, I don't need that. I'm like, Stu, what's going on? Man, I'm going home. I'm going home. I'm really? He's like, yeah. And I was like, okay. Cause I don't want to say like, that seems odd, Stu. I don't think you have a chance, yeah. but, and I was right he, to feel that way, but he was so, he was so, he's giving away everything. Yeah, he's so sincere. He yeah, absolutely was, yeah, believable. Like I was, he was so confident he was leaving. Well, I would have been like, had I really known Hopper at that point, I would, of course, kill the dream. Right. <laughs> because I've got no problem right. being a dream. But player. I don't have, I also don't have any, I, I couldn't look at his pay. You know, I wouldn't know. Yeah. I just knew that I felt that everything I'd seen and everybody I've talked to, and I just knew Stu, like, you know, based, just based on his history alone, yeah. it, it was, it was just outrageous. And so on the 16th, going away party, like oh all the white guys in the middle, Right. The little Stonehenge area. They're all, you know, oh all the solid guys. They had a little going away feast for Hop. Right. And, uh, you know, I rarely went to the chow hall to eat. Yeah. Like, I had to go basically every day because when I left, I'd see the warden and she'd call me over. Hey, Marco Rubio's coming next week. Get the unit ready. Right. Or you got three judges coming on Tuesday. Get the unit ready. And so that was my time to have interactions with her. And so I'd go up to the unit. I'd go up to the chow hall, grab a tray, give it to one of the broke guys come out and have my interactions with the executive staff and then keep it moving. Well, as I'm going through the line, at this point, it's like, you know, they fed us around 11, 11.30. And Grasshopper is sitting at the table with one of his buddies. And, he, and I, man, it was heartbreaking because as I'm walking by, he's saying, they didn't call me this morning. I wonder why not. I'm supposed to be going home. And I'm like, because I saw the going away party. I didn't know it was a going away party for him. Right. I just assumed one of the other guys caught a break. And so then I'm like, what's this guy talking about? You know, because I understand, I understood his case. And I'm like, look, you got essentially nothing coming, given the state of the law at that time. Yes. And so, you know, and it was just heartbreaking hearing, him. I wonder if there's something wrong. Maybe, you know, maybe Kelly can call the court. Because Riggs had it set up to where he was speaking with the court clerks on Hopper's behalf. Yeah, that's not possible. That's, that's not possible. You cannot, like, you can call the court clerk and ask information about yourself, but never on behalf of another inmate. Right, right. And like, the, like in the BOP, like, Pete, if I'm filing paperwork, Pete's allowed, another inmate is allowed to help me with my, my legal work, but he cannot call. You cannot call the the clerk of the court yeah. on my behalf. Yeah, you can't yeah, say, no. no, no, I'm helping him. <laughs> like, I don't no. care what you're yeah. doing. You're, now you're advocating on his behalf. Right. You can help prepare the papers. Yeah. But he has to advocate on his own behalf. And so that afternoon, we go back to the unit. You know, I'm, we're just hanging out bullshitting in the lobby. And probably about 3.30 in the afternoon, right before count, counts at four o'clock, here comes Kelly walking down the stairs. And it's like, and it wasn't a movement. You know, we had a closed compound. Right. And so there are some compounds where it's open compound. You can move around whenever you want to. On a closed compound, you can only move on specific time periods. Right. The fact that he's moving on a non-specific time period indicated that either he was called up to the office or he asked to go up to the office. Well, when a guy asks to go up to the office, nothing good's going to come out of that. Right. And so, you know, and a couple of the guys were standing at the door and they're like, Where's he going? You know? Right. And they watch him walk right up to the lieutenant's office. And right up like, the middle? Right up the middle. Right up the middle. That's <laughs> right. And I'm just like, so then I walked over because I, I, I associated it with Hopper now because I heard Hop say he's going to have Kelly call the court clerk. Right. And so sure enough, he goes, he checks in. And at the time him checking in. Well, so he goes to the lieutenant's office and he, he checks in. He says, hey, I'm, who knows what he says? I'm in danger. I need to get who you have to represent that you're on, you're in danger and you need to be put in protective custody. Right. So, so they put you in the shoe. They'll put you in the shoe. And uh, which for anybody out there is the hole. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, yeah and then it's a secured housing unit that they use to segregate the inmate from the general population. Right. And so four o'clock count comes and goes. 
evening shift officers come on board and officer upstairs, Mr. Halstead, he calls Grasshopper up to his office. At this point, Hopper's freaking the hell out because they watched his jailhouse lawyer go to the lieutenant's office and never returned. And so when the new officer comes on, on duty, he says, hey, Hopper, roll your cellmate, cell, <laughs> roll right. his locker up to my cell. I got to pack his stuff out. And at that point, you know, Hopper realized what was going on. Something's going on. Yeah, yeah. It's no good. That's no, no good. good. Right. And so, and when he gets back to the cell, before he moved his stuff, you got all the other guys coming, just trying to steal whatever they can out of Kelly's right. locker. Right. Because at this point, he owes like 16, 17 men in that unit thousands of dollars. And what was really heartbreaking is, like I said, he was targeting guys who weren't citizens. And so their family's not, you know, these weren't the cartel guys because they have yeah. lawyers. Right. You know, it was some broke dick guy who was coming to him saying, okay, well, I have my parents put together 600 bucks for you. Yeah. Some, you know, some Mexican, some family in Mexico doesn't have any money. He's trying yeah, to scrape together. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like these people are scraping together the little bit of money that they had to try to help get a few years knocked off for their son's case. And he left them all high and dry. So all of their actions were denied. None of them got relief. So that means they're all barred now from going forward. So not only did they lose the money, but now they just lost their last chance to obtain any kind of reduction in their sentence. And so that afternoon, that evening, uh, we see Hopper outside and he's just infuriated. You know, we're sitting at our table and I hear Hopper just going nuts talking to his brother, do you know what this guy did? Blah, 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 blah. I'm just like, wow. I mean, this is devastating because at this point it's all over the compound. Stewart's going nuts. Hop's going crazy. The 16 or 17 guys up in A1 are going crazy. There was a guy in A2, my unit, Cho, who, uh, you know, he's upside down. And so I, how, many people did, how many people did he end up getting? At, at last count, it was at least 17 or 18 guys. That paid between that paid whatever, 200 to 1,500 bucks. Yes. So these are all guys. He com either completely botched their case, never had a prayer to begin with. And then in Hopper's case, he pretended to be filing paperwork the whole time. He never filed anything. Well, no, he, did, did, oh, he, did, did he? he did. He did file the paper and it ultimately got denied. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yes. And so I, I thought he never filed anything. You know, the, what was where he kind of got shorted out with Hopper is, you know, the, there was like a 180 page manuscript that was already done. Well, he only left for like 92 of the pages because Hopper was still going through the rest of it. Oh, okay. So that's why if you look at the book Riggs wrote about Grasshopper, he had to put a, he had to pad it with a lot of like personal anecdotes. Right. Because there's just not enough material to tell the entire story. Right. And so um, a couple days later, at this point, is Amadeo and I are hanging out in the center quad and uh, here comes the well, lieutenant. Right. Well, what, what about also hit Hopper's biker gang? They bought him, didn't they buy him a oh, bike? Well, they have a ton of bikes. They had a motorcycle for him. Okay. And they so, came up to you know, get Of course, it. because they, he had his group. He's like, well, it's not a gang. It's a club. Sorry, it's a club. Okay. And, you know, his closest friends, you know, remember, he's been down for 30 years. So the yeah. guys that showed up to pick him up, these are like, you know, 60-year-old guys. Right. Showing up under our lace. You know, like the, the welcoming committee. And- uh, He never comes out. Yeah. He never comes out. So when they show up, of course, you know, the lieutenant's like, hey, what are you guys doing here? It's not a visitation day. <laughs> right. You know, it was like a Tuesday or a Wednesday. What are you guys coming over here for? And they're like, oh, we're here to pick up Harrison. He's not getting released. And so, like, the guys out on the parking lot, they knew even before Hopper. Right. And so you can imagine the level of disappointment because it's not just them, of course, but more importantly, his daughters, the grandkids. I mean, he's had, he had 13 grandkids. He's never had a chance to interact with on the street. Right. It's always been in visitation rooms. And so, you know, a very emotional experience. They're thinking like, hey, this is the best guy they've ever met. Whatever you need, I'll help you out for whatever, blah, 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 blah. I love you forever. And you just leave these guys all high and dry. And uh, just devastating. And so a couple of days later, Frank and I are out in the center quad. Right. And... It's about seven o'clock in the evening. And here comes the operations lieutenant with the compound officer. We had Ms. Lieutenant Warren and Mr. Hurd. And they come over and they're like, you know, and the next thing you know, they come over to our table and Hurd sits at the table. Like officers normally don't sit down at the table. And so he's like, 
takes his hat off. He's like, fellas, I need you guys' help. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't happen. No. Like, right. it's a, what are you talking about, Herd? He says, you guys hear what happened to Hopper? He's like, this piece of shit, scumbag rigs, blah, 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 blah. You know, they're, they keep, they drag this guy. They keep him in the hole for like months. Like right. normally they'll transfer a guy quickly to get him off the compound. They just slow walk this guy. And uh, he explains the situation. Hopper's totally upside down. There's nothing, of course, that the Bureau can do. I mean, yeah. you're apologetic in the sense that, man, it's unfortunate that it happened to you. Most of the guys, they wouldn't have cared about. But it was enough of an issue to where they said, you know what? Let's go talk to Rossini and Amadeo. Because to the extent there's anybody on that compound who's going to be able to do anything to try to get Hopper out from underneath this mess, right. they know to come talk to us. Right. Warren, Lieutenant Warren's like, look, we need your guys' help. We need you guys to take over Hopper's case. I'm like, <laughs> you understand? He's got nothing coming. Right. I mean, unfortunately, the guy's, he's like, well, look, can you guys at least look at it that way? We know that people who know what they're talking about are saying he's got nothing coming. And Frank's saying nothing too, right? Well, Frank's the, 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 no, look, I love Frank and there's not a better attorney in the system than Frank. What he was able to produce in prison is something that exceeded my wildest imagination. He essentially had a small boutique law firm where he was knocking out hundreds of appeals. Right. I personally watched Frank in five years win 200 sentence reductions. Right. I were getting walked off the compound frequently. And the thing about Frank is he believes he can win any case. Right. You know, you got a guy operating at like 180 IQ. He's, yeah. he's operating on a level like he will outsmart prosecutors. Like I never win on the law. I'm not going to beat an attorney on the law. Right. Like I can beat him on the facts. Because I'll have a better understanding of the facts because I have access to the defendant and I have the case file. And I can draw inferences based on accurate information rather than information they're relying upon through either their cooperators or some biased agent. So I can have that advantage. So there's a difference between winning factually and winning legally. Amadeo beats him in court. Right. I just beat him into submission. Right. But I was going to say, but some, but if you just. So then when they come to Frank and Frank's like, look, I'll take a look at it. And of course, Frank, you know, puts on the cape, mm -hmm, have mm -hmm. him come see me. <laughs> you know, and he turns to his scribe, put Hopper down for <laughs> the April filings. I'm just like, Frank, man, I've looked, the guy's got nothing come. We will correct this injustice. <laughs> I'm like, all right. <laughs> no, but I'm like, okay, look, you know, yeah. if anybody can do it, yeah, it's going to be Amadeo. Yeah. And well, so, listen, in my case, I have multiple lawyers on the street, big time lawyers, nothing. You got nothing. You can't get nothing. The guy that defended um, uh, T.I. or I.T. No, T.I., mm -hmm. you know, said when he, when I was trying to get to him to do my 2255, he's like, Listen, I'd take your money if I thought you had a chance. Yeah. So everybody said, said you know, yeah. and Frank, same thing. <laughs> I will not allow them to do this. And That's so, nice. and here's the thing. He, he won at such a high frequency that the government didn't object when the Bureau said, hey, we're going to send him home on home confinement for CARES Act. Like, yeah, get him out. Yeah, yeah, he's already such a problem. Get him away, from, get him away from that clientele yeah, base. That's right. He's like, if you, he, if he had to serve twenty five years, he would have walked out thousands of men. Yeah, as it stood at that point, he was already like several hundred guys. I mean, he had like a little tote board. He's like a fifteen hundred years reduced. Yeah, you know, just an outrageous level of production. And uh, so, sure enough, here comes Grasshopper a day later. Sits down at the table. You know, there's Amadeo. Explain to me what happened, Hop. So, you know, he's giving us the whole story. Avondale's got one of his scribes taking notes. Go upstairs, prepare a memo. And uh, Frank starts building the claims. And a, a year into the action, you know, Frank actually gets him back into court. Really? Yes. <laughs> Frank found uh, amendment ret ret a retroactive amendment that Hopper, of course, not knowing anything, didn't realize, hey, you could have been entitled to this sentence reduction. A few years earlier. Mm. So Hop, you know, Amadeo gets him in and he uses that as the hook to now say, hey, look, if you're going to resentence him, take into consideration the 3553A factors and this, 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 this. You know how Amadeo starts staggering. Yeah. Do, 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 do. So uh, what unfortunately happened for Hopper was COVID hit. 
And so man, after the whole thing with Riggs, Hopper finally moved down to our unit. And so now I'm helping him in unit. Amadeo's helping him outside of the unit. And then of course we get COVID. So now he's stuck in our unit. And so there's no way for him to interact with Amadeo because Amadeo lived in the B housing unit. So at this point, I take over the case. And we litigated up until the point where the judge says she's going to entertain it. And about a year later, she sat on it for a year. The 11th Circuit came down and said, no, we're not going to allow the men to use the sentence reduction aspect of the First Step Act another provision of the statute. We're not going to let the men in Hopper circumstance use that provision to obtain a modification of the sentence. Even though had he been sentenced today, he would have 20 years less. We don't care. And so that's what the law stated, stayed at for two years. Once the first step back took effect, the sentencing guidelines were subsequently amended to where now the men are in, who are in Hopper's particular circumstance can come back to court and ask for the court to exercise its discretion to modify his sentence. And so at the time I left, I had already prepared the motion and we were just waiting for the guideline to take effect. So I left you know, 11 months before right. it became operational. So he had to literally wait those 11 months. And so like I keep monitoring the docket and whatever attorney they have to assist them with hasn't yet filed the papers. But we anticipate the papers being filed literally any week. Okay. What happened to Riggs? Riggs, very unfortunate circumstances. He gets transferred after he gets slow walked out of Coleman Low. He gets sent to SeaTac. SeaTac is a facility in Washington. So he's sent 3,000 miles away. No contact with his family. You know, he's, you're, you're not having visits right. with any high degree of frequency when your family's in Alabama and you're now in Washington. Yeah. And so he spends his time at uh, SeaTac. Then he gets transferred to a prison in Mississippi called Yazoo. Oh, man. And the thing about Yazoo is, although we were all now at the low security level, Yazoo is a disciplinary low. Right. So the guys that can't program or function at your regular low, they get sent there. So it's a lot more rambunctious yeah. than your standard type low. And uh, word made its way back to the compound. Of course, none of us were there, so I don't know exactly what the exact circumstances were. But sure enough, word made its way back to the compound that shortly after Riggs arrived at Yazoo Low, he was assaulted, he was stabbed, and you know a bunch of Hispanic guys took off on him. So, you know, it's a very small system. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, they don't, you, you can't you, sue. You don't, have, you don't have the ability to sue the other inmate, so your only real option is to hurt him. You know, and so, and of course, there's going to be other guys at the other prison who just have a loyalty to the car, particularly someone whose transgressions were that pronounced. Mm -hmm. Like, had he taken the money, filed a good faith motion and lost, hey, you take it on the chin. Yeah. But when you're bringing claims that the judge ultimately says these aren't even cognizable, right? Like, oh, you just ripped them off from the gate. At that point, people in your particular car, even if they're at a different yard, they're going to do something yeah. to you. Well, so what's funny is a lot of guys, especially guys that don't really understand the system, is they think, well, I'll check in and I'll get moved to another prison and I can start all over. No, like the, this, there's not enough people in the system. There's so few, well, it's not that there's, there's a ton of them, of people, but you're all categorized into, you know, pins or mediums or lows. So a lot of them move between lows or between mediums. So somebody is going to go with you or somebody at the, one of the places you've been at is going to show up at that prison. Mm -hmm. So if you're lucky enough to get there and be there for three months and nobody knows who you are and what you've done, you're lucky because guess what? Somebody's going to show up and be like, holy shit, look, that's Riggs. You know what this motherfucker did? Yeah. And they're going to tell the story. And then you, you're you lulled into a false sense of security. And one day you just, you're walking the track and somebody walks up and just bam. Or a baseball bat, you, yeah. or a, you know, it gets, it escalates very seriously, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, it's and, not, it's not going to be a harsh, it's not going to be a harshly worded email. <laughs> well, you know, like when I transferred out from the West Coast, I get put 
my soulmate was a captain in the Gambino crime family. Right. And so before he, before I move in, he goes and starts asking around. I was like, you know, there's, I came from Lompoc. Well, there's 20 guys at the prison in Florida who were former guys from California. Right. So he goes and he finds one guy. He's like, so we know we talked for a little bit. I knew a bunch of the fellows up at Leavenworth. I knew some of the guys at Lompoc. And so he's like, oh, okay. Meanwhile, he's got the counselor saying, yeah, yeah, stand up, dude, good charges, solid. Right. So he's like, oh, okay. So now he wants to go get informal work. So he goes over to B building. He talks to like one of the black guys. He's like, man, of course I know Pete. He got the life sentence off my partner. Right. Then he goes talk to a guy from A4, another black guy. He's like, yeah, man, he knocked off half my, my friend's sentence. He talks to a Mexican guy. He's like, man, he knows, he's helped at least 10 guys that I know of. And so when he finally comes back, he's like, yeah, you can move in, man. Why don't you tell me you did law? I don't, a guy that shows up doesn't need to say anything. Because if you're competent, everybody on that yard is going to know within three days, man, this guy's a badass. This guy's, you know, this is the real fucking deal right here. Listen, I forget exactly how it goes, but Donovan Davis. Mm -hmm. um, so Donovan's a guy, a in, in, uh, big black guy. He's, he's, he's at least, he's six foot, right? He's oh, about yeah. six foot. Certainly. Big round belly, beard. He's, he's Indian, okay? from India. He's Indian, but he's Jamaican. So in Jamaica, there's a, a population of, segment of the population is actually from India. So he speaks, he, he can speak uh, with the, the whole Jamaican, you know, Patois thing, mm -hmm. but he speaks perfectly English. But listen, he's absolutely hilarious. And so he met Pete, talked to Pete briefly, and then told a couple other people about Pete. Oh yeah, yeah, he's a good guy. He does. Uh, I talked to him the other day. He does legal work. So, so yeah, yeah, he's here from California. He's this. Here's it. And then Pete comes up to Donovan, who's honestly a big teddy bear. He wouldn't hurt a fly, but comes up to Donovan. Do you remember this? Walks up to him and, and he goes, "Hey, hey, motherfucker." He goes, he goes "What are you fucking? Do? Uh, keep my name out of your fucking mouth. What are people coming up to me? What are you telling people about uh, uh, that I do legal work? You don't fucking say nothing. People get stabbed over shit like that." And he's like, he goes, "Pete." Pete, <laughs> is that, am I right? It wasn't. Yeah, if well, I didn't say nothing about the stabbing, but yeah, oh, okay. I told him, look, <laughs> at the higher security level institutions, you don't do that because right. what it does is it creates, now you got a lot of traffic coming over. Right. Like guys that are all like unsolicited, they're just coming like, hey man, can you take a look at my case? Can you take a look like, oh man. You know what I mean? Like uh, the overwhelming majority of men, unfortunately, don't have anything coming. That doesn't mean they didn't have cognizable claims or meritorious claims, but usually by the time they meet someone like me, it's five, six, seven years into your sentence. Yes, but you were very aggressive. Like, well, no, but here's the thing. <laughs> he was, well, you were because Donovan was like, he's, he's, listen, this guy, I don't, I don't he's, uh, he said you were, uh, he goes, he's extremely intense, extremely intense. Well, the thing also is I had shown him some documents on, look, this is how you do this. I showed him this. And then he went around and gave it to another guy. It's like, look, oh. man, I shared it with you. Right. Like, don't give the papers that I give you so you to familiarize yourself with this particular issue to some other guy. Right. Because now that guy comes behind Donovan's back to me. And I'm like, why is a stranger coming to me? With paperwork I gave you. But I, paperwork I gave you. Yeah. I was like, look, man, you don't, like, and I knew it was his first time down. And so I'm like, look, you know, in prison, you don't do that. You're interacting with somebody on a one-to-one -one basis. And, and so, yeah, that's how I actually ended up meeting you. That's actually how yeah. I ended up meeting... Frank. Or Donovan. Yeah, poor Donovan. And- uh, Cause I wrote a book about, I wrote a story about Donovan called The Gap. He's just, he's still locked up. Um, but uh, yeah. Recently was, transferred to another low security institution. Yeah. And- Is it a low or did he go to a camp? Excuse me, yeah, minimum security. Mi yeah, yeah. And so that's where he's, uh, he's gonna end up finishing his sentence. He's down to just a few years. Yeah. If he can get into the drug program between now, because don't forget, over since the last, since 2019 now, he's already earned another three years off in FSA credits. Um, so funny. Uh, okay. Well, I feel good about this. Do you have any, you have, uh, you, you have anything else? No. No? no. What do you think? I think it's good. Are we good? Yeah. You want me to wrap it up and let's, then? Let's wrap it up and let's do the SBF. Okay, so. All right, good. All right, so, well, one, Thank you. I, I appreciate you coming out and, and doing this. Hey, I really appreciate you guys watching. Do me a favor and uh, hit the subscribe button if you like the video. Hit the bell so you get notified of videos just like this. 
leave comments in the comment section. Uh, also, uh, please consider joining uh, my Patreon. I really appreciate it. Please share the video to anybody that you think uh, can help out with some of the topics and stuff that we talked about here. Really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. See ya.